wartime contracting in both Iraq and Afghanistan. With hundreds of billions of dollars of United States taxpayer dollars invested in these two theaters since 2001 and more to come, it is critical that we continue to strengthen our oversight of the contracting in these areas. Now, before I begin my substantive remarks, I just want to address a procedural issue for the benefit of our subcommittee members and the public. Uh, we did have an arrangement uh, with the Commission earlier on uh, that we would have the report released to us and not by the press until the evening of this hearing or on the hearing. Uh, that didn't occur, so I apologize to the other members on that. We we're about to find out why it is that that didn't occur uh, on that basis. We wanted to give the members an opportunity to be uh, prepared uh, to ask questions uh, of the committee and to, uh, to work on that. So we're going to find out what happened there uh, and do that. I still su suspect that members have had an opportunity to prepare themselves notwithstanding. The United States' reliance on contractors has reached unprecedented levels over the last eight years reaching upwards of a quarter of a million contractors on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan for the Department of Defense alone. That doesn't even include those that are working for the Department of State and the United States Agency for International Development or other agencies. It's an extraordinary number by all accounts of civilian contractors in a combat environment. Unfortunately, while numbers of contractor personnel and related expenditures has ballooned, the opposite trend occurred with respect to oversight. The United States National Security Departments allowed their program oversight staff and expertise to dwindle to the point that in many circumstances contractors have been hired to oversee other contractors' work. Report after report has identified the acute need to rebuild executive branch oversight capacity, but as yet we have seen little to show for it. We need to fix our broken contracting and oversight function in the executive branch and add to it a proper mix of oversight from independent sources and for Congress. In that light, the creation of the Commission on Wartime Contracting in 2008 was the product of efforts by several of us in Congress dating back to 2005. At that time, it became clear to us that we needed an entity that could provide sustained oversight of wartime contracts similar to the efforts of the Truman Committee during the 1940s. Waste, fraud, and abuse in wartime contracts transcends politics. Oversight should not be the luxury of a divided government and languish when congressional majorities and the President share a common political party. We saw the disastrous result of that approach as we initiated and prosecuted action in Iraq. I have high expectations for what the Commission on Wartime Contracting can accomplish, and we're here this morning to assess its progress to date. The Commission's interim report highlights a number of issues related to management and accountability, logistics, security, and reconstruction efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. One interesting case described in the report shows the costly construction of a duplicative dining facility at the cost of $30 million. That's certainly representative of such issues. But it's also important that the Commission break new ground. Uh, there's no sense in creating an oversight entity that merely duplicates the work that is going on by Inspectors General or the Government Accountability Office. We already received those reports, although we do expect that you'll review those and synthesize them and use them to inform your work. I look forward to hearing what the Commission is finding out that we don't already know about. And in short, I expect that our witnesses this morning will ensure us that the investment in their activities was a worthwhile decision. We in Congress, as the sponsors of the Commission, need to hear about any challenges or hindrances the Commission faces in conducting its work. For example, I'm concerned that the Commission will not be able to fulfill its mandate without a semi-permanent semi presence in theater, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that today. I would note that according to the report, the Commission has only taken two trips to date to Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm also concerned that the current one-year mandate of the Commission might allow responsible government officials and culpable contractors to sort of wait it out. The Commission's charge is too important to suffer defeat at the hands of obstruction or delay, and I don't want to see a lack of subpoena power deter the Commission from going after recalcitrant parties if that is a problem. This subcommittee stands ready to assist the Commission in regard to whatever is appropriate in conducting their official duties. The dynamic in Iraq and Afghanistan is changing significantly, specifically as we're moving to draw down activities in Iraq while at the same time increasing resources in Afghanistan. Within this framework, we must look at the mistakes of our hurried decision-making with respect to contracts in Iraq and avoid a repeat of those mistakes in Afghanistan. As we've said before, lessons learned must be lessons followed. We'll need every bit of, assist of experience, judgment, and resolve at our disposal to get this right. As such, it's imperative that the Commission has every opportunity and capacity to perform its work without hindrance. So I want to take this opportunity to thank the Commissioners, the four that are here and the rest of your members, if you'll be good enough to exchange that with them and the staff for undertaking this critical public service assignment. Over a month ago, when I appeared before the Commission at its first hearing hosted by the House of Representatives, 
Uh, we noted that we'd be looking forward to this date when we switch seats and have the opportunity to hear from you on your progress. Done right, your help will safeguard the lives of our civilian and military personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan. Done right, your work will help rebuild the trust of the United States taxpayers to put in their government to wisely spend their dollars under difficult circumstances. Those twin goals, benefiting our people in harm's way and rebuilding the trust of those here at home, represent the bedrock intention behind the creation of the Commission. So thank you for being there. At this point, I defer to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman. I'm pleased to be here, pleased to, to uh, hear from the testimony, particularly uh, former Congressman Shays. I know that he traveled to Iraq and Afghanistan a couple of times, right? <laughs> More than a few. And uh, I, I just uh, am pleased that uh, we're doing more oversight here, obviously. There's never too much oversight that can be done, and in particular in this area. The U.S. Uh, military base budget for the current fiscal year is more than $500 billion. Congress has uh, appropriated roughly $830 billion for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I can commiserate with the Commission on how tough it has to be to get access uh, to information uh, that uh, you need to do your work. I've been waiting for more than two months uh, for competitive bidding information just on a small subset of 2008 defense contracts. Um, details appear to be shrouded in mystery here. In fact, I, I look forward to the possibility of uh, having someone who is knowledgeable about the Pentagon's uh, process or contracting process uh, appear under oath so that we can get answers to, to some of these questions that uh, we've wanted answers to for a long time on the competitive bid bidding process. And to that end, uh, I look forward to the witness's testimony and thank the chairman again for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Flake. So now the subcommittee will receive testimony from the witnesses on our first panel, and I'd first like to introduce you, uh, if I may, Mr. Shays. You want to? Okay. Let me introduce the panel, if I could. I understand you're going to deliver the remarks. Is that what you're signaling? Oh, I will. I definitely will. Right. <laughs> it never goes away, does it, Chris? <laughs> When, uh, when we were, Chris was in there and he used to sit here, he would always be buzzing over and sharing. So it's, it's, uh, it's good. Mr. Michael J. Tebow serves as the Commission's co-chair and was appointed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. From 2007 to 2008, Mr. Tebow worked as the Director of Navigant Consulting, and prior to that he was the Chief Compliance Officer at Unisys Federal Systems. Mr. Tebow also previously served as the Deputy Director of the Defense Contract Audit Agency where he worked from 1973 to 2005. Mr. Tebow holds a BA from Southern Oregon University and a Master's of Art from Central Michigan University. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Christopher H. Shays also serves as co-chair of the Commission on Wartime Contracting and was appointed by House Minority Leader John Boehner. From 1987 to 2009, Mr. Shays served in the United States House of Representatives, where he represented the 4th District in Connecticut. During his time in Congress, Mr. Shea served as ranking member of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, as well as chairman of its predecessor committee. Mr. Shea holds a Bachelor of Arts from Principia College, as well as an MBA and an MPA from New York University. Mr. Charles Tiefer serves as a member of the Commission on Wartime Contracting and was appointed by Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. He's a professor at the University of Balt Baltimore School of Law, where he specializes in government contracts and contract legislation. From 1993 to 1994, Mr. Tifa served as Acting General Counsel in the House of Representatives. From 1984 to 1995, he was the Solicitor and Deputy General Counsel in the United States Senate. Mr. Tifa holds a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and a JD from Harvard Law School. Colonel Grant S. Green is a member of the Commission on Wartime Contracting and was appointed by President George W. Bush. He currently serves as the Chairman of Global Marketing and Developmental Solutions, Inc., and Development Solutions, Inc., he has held a number of senior positions in the government, including Under Secretary of State for Management, Assistant Secretary of Defense, and Executive Secretary for the National Security Council. Colonel Green is retired from the United States Army and previously served on the commission as an acting co-chair. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Arkansas and an MS from George Washington University. So thank you all for making yourselves available to testify here today and for the work that you're doing uh, on the commission as well as your substantial expertise. And now it's the policy of this subcommittee to swear in the witnesses. So if you'd kindly stand and raise your right hands. If there are any persons that are going to be sharing testimony with you today, you might ask them to stand as well. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the uh, witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, as 
all of you know uh, already, your written testimony will be placed on the record and accepted by the committee. Uh, at this time, we would like to give you the opportunity to make remarks, opening remarks over a five-minute period. It will be followed by questions and answers. So, Mr. Thibault, if you care to start. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting us to speak to you today about our interim report. Uh, we will keep our opening statements brief to allow maximum time for discussions and questions. The Commission has four other members. They are Clark Irvin, Linda Gostaitis, Robert Henke, Dove Zakheim. The precipitating event for Chairman Tierney's inviting us here today is the official release of the interim report to Congress entitled, At What Cost? Contingency Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our report identifies many long-standing issues for awarding, managing, and auditing the vital contracts that support logistics, security, and reconstruction missions. These include uh, uh, shortages in the Federal Acquisition Workforce, poorly defined and executed contracts, inadequate planning, weak provisions for accountability, unnecessary work, and costly rework, problems that are undermining attainment of national objectives and wasting billions of taxpayer dollars. We will describe some of our preliminary observations. Uh, as Congress intended, the interim report is preliminary and tentative. At what cost provides an interim statement on key focus areas and results which are listed in the report? It, since 2001, Congress has appropriated, uh, as was stated here, over $830 billion to fund U.S. operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Over that period, America's reliance on contractors has grown to unprecedented proportions to support logistics, security, and reconstruction efforts. More than 240,000 contractor employees, about 80 percent of which are foreign nationals, now work in Iraq and Afghanistan supporting Department of Defense. Uh, additional contractor employees support Department of State and U.S. Agency for International Development. These 240,000-plus contractor employees actually outnumber U.S. military personnel in the two theaters. They provide critical support, and like our military personnel, many have paid a personal price. As of May 27, 2009, 4,973 men and women of America's military and at least 13 civilian employees of the Department of Defense have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is less well known that more than 1,360 contractor employees have also died. Criticisms of the contingency contracting system and suggestions for reform in no way diminish the sacrifice of, of the military and those contractors that gave their lives. In discussing the major subject areas of at what cost, we'll specifically address several issues of immediate concern. Such issues matter now, right now. There are, are, they are so important that the Commission is urging corrective action well ahead of our final report. First, management and accountability. The report's first chapter on management and accountability addresses a number of cross-cutting themes. The linchpin of contingency contracting is human capital. Acquisition, especially in contingencies, depends on its government workforce. The contracting officer's representatives, or what's referred to as CORs, serve a critical role. They are the individuals on the front line of contractor performance. They're in charge of making sure that the contractor does what it's supposed to do. They monitor, for instance, whether a construction contractor works soundly or defectively. At what cost identifies the process for designating and training cores as an issue of immediate concern? There are too few cores. They are inadequately trained. Warfighters often learn of their added duty of contractor su supervision only after arriving in theater. In one of our field trips, we were briefed by the 10th Mountain Division uh, Technical Oversight, and, and they arrived in January to fight a war, and at the same time, they were named to this corollary duty and uh, simply uh, uh, were not trained at, at all in support of that. As to the subject of financial accountability, the Commission has found a large number of ineffective contractor business systems, including management of subcontractors, with a large number of unresolved audit findings. The Commission analyzed $43 billion in awards to 15 of the largest contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. Fifty percent of the contractor billing systems, the basis for requesting payment 
uh, from the work for billing the government and 42 percent of estimating systems used in the pre-award for contract proposals contained significant deficiencies. Since the interim report was prepared for printing, a month ago, DCAA has Defense Contract Audit Agency has further identified three more business systems at DynCorp International as inadequate to include uh, the labor and billing systems that are absolutely essential to document and review costs. The Commission's May 2009 hearing heard that through fiscal year 2008, the DCAA has taken exception to over $13 billion in question and unsupported costs. In short, the environment in Iraq and Afghanistan has been and continues to be susceptible to waste, fraud, and abuse. Additionally, there is an immediate need for greater accountability in the use of subcontractors. Subcontractors account for about 70 percent of contract work, but the government has very little visibility into their operations. The Commission has surveyed all the reports by the inspectors general and other oversight entities. It's interesting that there are 11 such organizations that have issued reports since the outset of, of the two wars. Uh, we've, we've looked at a total of 537 and cross-referenced those reports and, and, and derived 1,287 different recommendations over that period. Uh, many of these recommendations have not been fully, uh, fully uh, implemented, and a major focus of our near-term activity will be to try to understand why they haven't been implemented, and, and those organizations that said they would take action, uh, why they have not taken action. The U.S. government uses as its key logistic program in theater what's referred to as LOGCAP, the Army Logistics Civil Augmentation Program. This is a multi-billion dollar contract, over $30 billion to date, that covers a myriad of services from vehicle maintenance to dining hall operation. The third iteration of this contract, Log Cap 3, was awarded to KBR as a sole vendor. The Log Cap 4 contract awarded in 2008 requires task order competition, competition among three vendors, KBR, Floor, and DynCor International. But at the present, Log, Log Cap 3 still predominates and dwarfs in terms of contract value. Uh, DCAA Director uh, April Stevenson stated at the Commission's May 2009 hearing, I don't think we're aware of another program contract or contractor that has had the significant number of su suspensions or referrals. In its recent response to that DCA te testimony, the Log Cap 3 contractor, KBR, implied that most referrals for possible fraud called suspected irregular conduct by DCAA have been resolved by contracting officers. However, DCAA has advised us that as of our May 4th hearing date, none of its referrals for possible fraud had been resolved. The total of 32, 32 were still open. And that resolution of suspected irregular conduct uh, referrals would be performed by D Department of Defense Criminal Investigative Service or by the Department of Justice, not by contracting officers. Both the Iraq drawdown and the Afghanistan buildup raise serious questions about logistics contracting issues. For example, the Commission has learned that American bases during this drawdown hold more than 600,000 line items of property, trucks, generators, spare parts, clothing, tools, and, and much more. Because of the poor documentation in the early days of Iraq operations and a shortage of property management officers, base commanders often do not know what property is on the base. And as a point of reference, those 600,000 line items, there are three certified and trained property managers that have that responsibility and another 12 that are part of the property management process that, that have not been fully trained and vetted to look at 600,000 line items as we draw down in Iraq. Billions of dollars must be moved elsewhere in a region, returned for stateside use, handed over to the government of Iraq, sold or scrapped. But the lack of information, resources, and planning have set the stage for massive confusion and loss. As an issue of immediate concern, the drawdown of U.S. forces in Iraq risks incurring enormous rate, waste. The Commission identified more than $2 billion in new projects in Iraq that are now being analyzed by us. A number of the projects in the pipeline may be unnecessary. For example, during an April 2009 visit to Camp Delta in Iraq, the Commission identified a $30 million 
construction contract to build a new dining facility uh, being built next near a recently expanded and upgraded facility. The new facility is due to be completed in December 2009, um, somewhere between a year and two years where U.S. troops are required to be out of Iraq. Prompt review of such projects in the pipeline could save taxpayers many billions of dollars in unnecessary spending. Chapter 3 of At What Cost addresses the subject of private security contractors, one of the major subjects set forth specifically in the Commission's statutory mandate. The report traces the significant events that shaped the subject, from the beginning of outsourcing of, of security in the 1980s and 1990s to the incident of the killing of Iraqi citizens by uh, Blackwater employees in Nisar Square. After that incident, the Secretaries of Defense and State, as well as Congress, through their continuous oversight, implemented significant reforms. I think it's important to note that the reforms appear to have worked in this case. The State Department reported 11 deadly force, discharge of weapons, incidents in the month of July 2007 alone. There were another nine deadly force incidents in the month of September of 2007. For the full year ending due to the increased controls visibility over security, for the full year ending in May 2009, there have been only two for that year uh, incidents of uh, use of force. So with proper attention, uh, improvements can be made. You know, our point is that uh, there's an awful lot that's not getting proper attention. The Commission identified a number of specific concerns related to private security contractors as a result of our visit to Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, uh, the Armed Contractor Oversight Division, or what's referred to as ACOD, is the office that oversees private security contractors, licenses them, vets, vets them, uh, makes sure they're complying with contract terms and conditions and such, and it's a very large role. Uh, at the present, there's such a large role for a contractor, a security contractor, to support that that raises issues about conflicts of interest. The post of deputy director, the number two person, the person that briefed us when we were there, is occupied by a senior Aegis private security contractor official. Uh, the director position, an 06 military level equivalent to a colonel, uh, while it's been approved to date, it has not been filled, identified, and authorized. And so even in contract terms, for example, sir, um, if there's a, a use of force incident and uh, there's mandatory coordination with the government of Afghanistan, it's identified that the contractor, Aegis, will do that, representing it for the United States government. That's the current process. The Commission's trip to Afghanistan in 2009 underlined already acute contracting problems in re reconstruction, another area where we're going to be focused intensely uh, during the next year. Serious shortages of U.S. government civilians are all too likely to trigger heavy reliance on contractors, for example, the vital provincial reconstruction teams. Thank you, uh, Mr. I, I can't imagine that. Uh, th so you must have one minute, uh, 30 seconds for Mr. Tiefer and Mr. Green. <laughs> no. Go ahead. Congrats. Actually, it's just the two of us, sir. <laughs> oh, is it really? Yes. Oh, we're, we have joint statements, and oh, we right. split and Mr. it Chief up. Or Mr. Green will just there, there, are, there are experts that are going to answer You're your questions. You're going to make them answer the tough questions. You're going to do yeah. the other thing. They're here for the tough questions, Mr. It's like being back in the service, right? Mr. Shays, go ahead. Just continuing on, uh, Chapter 5, entitled On the Agenda, provides a summary of activities the Commission has in progress or slated for study in the near future. Uh, there are over 30 bullet items, including a number of complex and far-reaching studies. The Commission encourages examination of the full list uh, on uh, pages 92 to 94. And uh, I'd like to just highlight, we'd like to just highlight a few. Assess methods of remedying understaffing of contract oversight and audit functions and assess the effectiveness of current efforts to estimate the optimum numbers and types of acquisition personnel. Assess what shortcomings in government knowledge and information systems undermine the accomplishment of the Iraq drawdown and the buildup in Af Afghanistan. Consider what processes and controls should be in place to manage decisions and assess risks of outsourcing logistic and security support services that may be considered inherently governmental functions. 
consider how best to improve the accountability and con contingency contract perfor contractor performance, including affirm aff affirmative consideration of, of performance in source selection, award fee determinations, and contractor performance evaluation. That was under management. Under logistics, assess potential alternatives to current logistics contractor support, including the poss uh, possible establishment of an installations management command to manage facilities once a contingency operation stabilizes. Identify reasons for the slow transition from log cap three to four. Under security, examine the sufficiency of current recruitment processes, background checks, and training to ensure the employment of possible PSC personnel, uh, private security personnel. Examine the potential use of civilian employees of the Departments of Defense and State in lieu of contract personnel in security roles, including the use of temporary appointments and reserve components. Under reconstruction, evaluate the effectiveness of capacity building reconstruction projects and determine the extent to which stakeholder collaboration is an integral part of acquisition planning, contract performance, and project sustainability. Assess the feasibility of establishing an interdepartmental uh, entity for planning and coordination reconstruction projects in contingency operations. And let me just uh, end by talking about a few activities. A full description of the Commission's milestones is in the report's Appendix B. In brief, the Commission members were named by, Ju uh, by July 2008. The Commission selected a professional administrative staff approaching 40 by January 2009. During September and October of 2008, Commissioners received briefings from more than 25 key organizations and programs. They also met with leading scholars and writers on contracting issues and with contractors. On February 2nd, 2009, the Commission held its first public hearing. The hearings featured testimony from the Inspector General for Iraq uh, Reconstruction, Seeger, including Seeger's two-year book-length study released the day, that day, Hard Lessons, the Iraq Reconstruction Experience. On May 4th, 2009, the Commission's second hearing uh, focused on the multi-billion dollar log cap contract for logistics support services. Commissioners and staff have made two trips to Iraq and Afghanistan to inspect work sites, review documents, conduct interviews, and receive briefings from officials on the ground. The first trip took place in early December 08 with an itinerary that included agency briefings in Baghdad and Kabul, as well as reviews of construction of the Baghdad Police College and task orders for reconstruction, excuse me, for construction and repair of the Bag Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. A 10-day investigative study in early April 2009 comprised a 15-person group of commissioners and staff that broke into three teams. One team worked in Iraq, the other two in Afghanistan. They conducted more than 125 meetings with employees of the Departments of Defense and State, USAID, the military, and employees of contractors working on a range of projects. The Commission continues to develop uh, tasks for research and investigation to extend and deepen its knowledge and to cope with new or changing issues. Our plans include many more trips to theaters of operation, additional hearings involving government agencies, non-governmental organizations, uh, academics, and members of the contracting community, and continued liaison with Congress. Before we conclude, we'd like to say a few words about the Commission staff. Virtually all of the commissioners, uh, commission staff are federal employees. Some are detailed from agencies and services, including the Army, the Air Force, the Departments of State and Defense, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, the Defense Contract Management Agency, the Defense Contract Audit Agency, and the U.S. Uh, Army, Corps of Eng Army Corps of Engineers. Some have served one or more tours in duty in theater, including working for the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, or as senior contracting officers supporting the Joint Contracting Command in Afghanistan. Others have served on congressional staff to work in GAO, state and defense, and held important positions in the commercial uh, industries, which are the focus of our study. They bring hundreds of years of combined experience and education in many fields to bear on our mission and have performed valuable work for their country. In conclusion, the Commission and staff of the Commission on Wartime Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan take very seriously the tasks that Congress has assigned to us. 
We appreciate how important these tasks are to improve support for our warfighters and our diplomatic employees. Uh, we sincerely thank you for the opportunity to describe our work to, to you today and pledge our best efforts to provide information, recommendations that will help you make good decisions on contingency operations. Mr. Chairman, we thank you for your support of this commission, but also as well your critical review. We know that this committee, as will the Senate, be looking at everything we do uh, to help us do a better job and to make sure we do a good job. Thank you. Thank both of you and the other witnesses as well. Oh, you're right, Mr. Shaysman. This is all about uh, working together. It isn't about criticism. Obviously, you've been at this only a few months, and uh, you've developed your staff, got your office space, tried to get your plan together. Uh, and I think that you've done a remarkable job in many respects and appreciate the interim report. Uh, the, I have a number of questions. I'm going to start off with some procedural things. As we go around a couple of rounds here, we'll get to some of the other issues on that. Uh, but one comment Mr. Thibault made was that uh, there were a significant number of reports and recommendations coming from those reports, many of which have not been implemented. Now, that should disturb us all. Um, and you also said later on, however, that there were a lot of issues outstanding that weren't getting enough attention. And you indicated that in the context of oversight was working in some respects with the security incidents being significantly down. So in the context of your plan, uh, are you in planning on reporting to Congress at some point how we might best utilize those investigative sources that are out there, the Government Accountability Office, the Inspectors General from the various departments, your work, how that ought to best be coordinated so that all of the issues are covered. And then I know you already said that on the second part of that, uh, you do intend to investigate why some of these uh, suggestions are not being implemented and recommendations. That will be important for us to know whether it's an executive inaction, legislative inaction, uh, that we're just not having enough hearings uh, tuned in enough on that, or whether it's all departmental and they just don't have the process there? Uh, yes, sir. You know, we intend to take those 1,200 plus uh, recommendations out of those 537 reports, and we intend to uh, trace each one to find out the status. We're aware that there are significant issues now on, on key recommendations. There is a direct tie in to correcting problems that we also have observed and others have reported uh, in, in the past. Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to note one thing I might share, and it's something that we're going to talk about and try to evaluate. When we are out in the field at forward bases and, and, and Camp Victory and Afghanistan and the you know, Joint Task Force 101, uh, the, the, universally they were supportive. But universally they said if there's anything this commission can do relative to the fact that we have so many, I cited 11 organizations so that it can be coordinated better because it seems like we're collecting information uh, and then turning around and collecting the same information two months later, it's just two months updated for a different organization. Uh, each of these oversight organizations has a vital job to do, but contingency environment is unique from an oversight because it's so distance oriented and you have to place some people on site and people going back and forth, but that's a, uh, th that's a worthy area to look at. And I'll ask some questions later on about just how we go about doing that and the personnel shortages. I think some of the uh, cap capacity issues are serious. But does the Commission feel that it has enough in-country presence over in uh, the theaters with, that you're uh, investigating? The Commission is uh, debating right now whether we should have permanent representation in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and then uh, obviously our commissioners will and our staff will be going repeatedly. Uh, and so that's something that we'll be able to get back to you very quickly on. Uh, but uh, we know that we need to be there in both countries. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some of the same concerns about uh, if you have so many recommendations. I'm sorry, my voice is a little hoarse here. Um, you've had 1,200 recommendations, you said, that have been put forward. Is that from your group or from no, the No, sir. That's, all, we all went over. through all 537. We sorted them. We cross-referenced them because we were tasked to build upon that work, not to recreate that work. Right. So some of those 1,200 uh, come from the other um, investigative bodies that uh, have put forward recommendations. All of the 1,200 that I referenced, okay. sir come from those organizations. And, and what, what remedy is there if these aren't uh, implemented? What, uh, what are, are we to do or what uh, are other bodies to do if they aren't uh, implemented? Uh, 
I, I think that's, that point is uh, spot on in terms of, of the emphasis, and it, it fits this subject of accountability. You know, if someone says they're going to correct a major problem and they're going to correct it within a certain time period and they don't, uh, one of the things we run into, uh, for example, because of turnover of staff, well, and in, in the, the aging, so well, I didn't really understand that. Uh, you know, I, I've just picked up that responsibility. But there's an absence of, first of all, recording what is being done with that. Some organizations, some of the IG organizations do a good follow-up. Uh, but the actions just aren't getting accomplished to the extent that, that organizations, government organizations, have agreed to do. We've, in, in talking with a lot of the uh, agencies on some other issues, uh, we're, we're often told we have a process by which we can't offer sole source contracts. We have to bid every contract out. Uh, yet you hear, you mentioned KBR, you had a sole source contract on for, for uh, certain activities there. Could that contract have been bid out? Isn't there a, a process that the Department of Defense has to go through if they don't bid a contract out? There's a JNA that has to be issued or, or something. Why, why are they able to still uh, have these contracts uh, sole sourced? Mr. Tiefer, you want to take that? Mr. Flake, that's a, an excellent question. Um, it has been some years um, that the Department of Defense has tried to have a later contract in which there would be three, com uh, later version, later iteration of log cap in which there would be three competitors. And they, they I think the talk about that goes back at, at least two years. They are now slowly phasing in that successor arrangement that would have competition among three companies. And that's a, an activity we're going to be following in theater. Um, but it has still not been activated in Iraq. That is, each task order under the log cap contract still has only one vendor, KBR. Uh, and there has been some concern voiced that that phasing in of a competitive arrangement is going too slowly. Well, I can tell you, I know you, that your jurisdiction covers just wartime, you know, in, in theater. But it seems that that problem goes beyond. Um, I, as I mentioned, I've been trying for months uh, to get access to some of these JNAs to justify uh, why some of these contracts aren't bid out. Um, and, uh, and I haven't been able to get them yet. And so I, I think, are some of these problems that you see in theater, you think that they go beyond that? Or, or is it justified just, just because of the circumstances uh, inherent in, in wartime? Uh, there, the, I, I'm... I'm um I'm not at all surprised that you're seeing similar problems um, back in the United States and in domestic context. There's no special exception in the Competition Contracting Act right. for wartime uh, sole sourcing. Uh, and the same exceptions that have been used in the past, um, in, um, uh, used to date in Iraq, have been used in the domestic United States. So you, you would run into the same problems. Are, are you, as part of your, your activities, asking for these JNAs uh, to, to see what justification was given for sole source? Uh, we, we do look at, not just at the justification and authority, the JNA, for uh, the, the, these contracts, but uh, at the subsequent documentation. Um, and we have been going through um, following up. Uh, the, J the JNA is often very superficial, just, uh, well, it's the exception for exigent circumstances or it's the exception for uh, this is the only available contractor. Uh, and we, we have followed those up to see whether it uh, really has to be done without competition. I, I, I might, sir, uh, add a point that this was a very unique contract in the sense, and, and, and it, it, uh, you could maybe think about whether it was dysfunctional in terms of the way it was established. But there was competition, but it's a 10-year contract. Cost type, dollar for dollar, 10-year contract. Once a year, it can be rolled over. So you're talking about a contracting action with a sole supplier that dates back to the 2003, I believe, time frame. And it's still in place because 10 years haven't passed. So there is no competition anymore. And that's why we're encouraged by the action to go to log cap four, where there's at least three vendors that will bid on every task order. We're discouraged by the pace at which that's being implemented. There are tremendous opportunities. We saw an example where 
the same type of work that was bid in Kuwait using log cap three had priced out at $120 million. It was $55 million less after competition came in. So competition's a good thing in the environment. There's nothing unique about uh, a wartime zone where you can't usually employ competition. Thank you. If I could, um, Mr. Flake, oh, excuse me, Grant, no, go, go on. Um, if I might add to uh, what uh, Commissioner Tebow said earlier and some of your concerns about uh, the 1,200 recommendations that have come from other uh, oversight organizations, which, to which we will certainly add a number of our own observations and recommendations. What, where we have a, a challenge, um, I believe, and that is uh, when we go away, uh, have we come up with procedures to permit, which will encourage follow-up? Uh, all of you have seen dozens and dozens and dozens of studies, as, as I have, uh, with some very valid recommendations uh, that collect dust. So one of the challenges we have, and a challenge that you may have, is how do we force some of these actionable recommendations uh, forward as, as we, you know, turn out the lights. And, and that's a problem that, that we face, or a challenge that we face, um, which is not much different than every other commission and oversight organization faces. Well, I think you've hit right on something that the three of us now, have, if, um, if I look at the panel collectively, uh, have honed right in on this. So we're going to really rely on the commission to give us uh, some direction at least to that is what you think ought to be done. You know, whose responsibility would it be to follow up? Would it be the executive? Would it be the department? Would it be Congress or whatever? And then it's going to be incumbent upon us to work with you to try to put that in legislation if necessary. If, if it's not legislation, then set up some series of hearings wherever we put the spotlight on whoever is responsible and, and keep uh, moving on that to get it done because it is ridiculous. You keep having Precisely. all of these uh, hearings go out there and, and stuff. Thank you. Um, Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. I was i um, interested in whether you think that we'll be in a position to make some sort of retrospective analysis of, you know, the, the sort of make versus buy decision, the decision to contract stuff out, the decision to, to sole source or multi-source the contracts, whether that really, you know, at the end of this we'll be able to step back and, and set up the general principles that, that will tell us whether it's a good idea to, to contract out a class of work or not. I'd love to just, uh, just make a comment that, when we talk about log cap three, that was a contract that was given to KBR before we went into Iraq. No one anticipated that we would be spending uh, incredible, uh, over $30 billion to one contractor. When we went to log cap four, which we bid out, three contractors have it, and then they will bid, a bid internally among the three. Uh, none of them getting more than, uh, I believe, $5 billion uh, a year. Uh, and uh, so we're talking over 10 years, $150 billion potentially. So we have introduced, the government has introduced uh, a form of competition there. Uh, but when we went into Iraq, there was one uh, person who had, in a sense, one company that had, in a sense, won the contract. Uh, in terms of the, the whole, uh, the number of recommendations that have been made and the 500 reports and so on. Our task is to categorize every one of them, to be able to come back and tell you which ones have been implemented, which ones haven't, why they, we think they've been implemented, why they haven't, and our recommendations of, of what uh, could and should be done. So the value, so when you see us looking at those past reports, it's not to rework them, it's just to know what they're, what's done and to make sure you know what's been done and, and, and hasn't been done. And, and sir, to, to your point about are we going to look at the contracting mechanisms, there's an absolute obligation to look at it. And uh, the type of contracts, whether uh, the competition has been used and makes sense. Uh, I'll make a couple of observations in fairness to the record. There are significant efforts to use competition in certain parts of contracting by, by the military and, and by state. 
but one of the areas we highlighted that we're really going to focus on in terms of the type of contracts is subcontracting. For example, in the log cap program, it's cost type contract. It's dollar for dollar. All the subcontracts are fixed price. So the prime gets dollar for dollar on the fixed price and all of their labor, but it's fixed price. And so it kind of begs the question, what, how good of a job is being done with that? Uh, there are foreign firms that are involved with that. Uh, what kind of uh, data analysis and records are going to be evaluated? That's the frustration you see in the report, and that's the obligation of the prime contractor, but we're going to be looking at the prime contractor's system to be sure that they're fulfilling their contractual requirements. Yeah. Um, will, will that sort of analysis also look at the, the in-house versus contractor approach? I mean, yeah. Once upon a time, there were mess sergeants, right? And, and so the question is whether, you know, ultimately that would actually have been a better deal for the taxpayer to go the traditional route, um, turn up the soldiers' salaries if necessary. Um, and similarly, are there, are there rules of thumb evolving or maybe already existing in terms of the amount of contracting oversight per dollar of, of spent, you know, that there, as a rule of thumb, you want one person on the ground overseeing every $20 million of, of money spent or something like that? Um, you know. Well, what I saw in Afghanistan personally is the Defense Contract Management Agency went through and identified um, several thousands of tasks that needed to be done and drew it down to 537 individuals theater-wide that needed to go out and look at that work being done. The unfortunate part was the, uh, the, the number was either 160-something or 180-something, but it was only 36 percent of those positions were filled. So about two out of three positions, there's nobody looking at the contractor. Yeah, so so, so they'd the done a good analysis, they just hadn't done the work. Yeah, so what's the nature of the training that's missing? Um, that's, that's also a very good question, uh, because Defense Acquisition University has developed a couple of courses. But I, I, would, I would tell you, uh, my example of 10th Mountain Division, when we brought these individuals in, the military, the great Americans, and said, so what about training? They'd had none. So there's a course at Fort Belvoir, and, they, and then they told them, they said, well, we got this online eight-hour, 16-hour course. And one of them looked at me and said, right. And he said, because of connectivity problems, I spent 30 days trying to take this eight-hour course and off and on, off and on, because I kept getting cut off. And I finally said, the heck with it. I'm not, I, I can't finish this course, so I'm going to do the best job I can. They're out there trying to do the best job they can, but they're not equipped with the training. So there's training that's been developed, but if they don't get it before they go. I think and another, yeah. another point is, uh, as uh, Chairman Thibault mentioned, um, in addition to the shortage of oversight personnel, whether it's 160 or 180, uh, many of them are miscast. And we, we referenced a few examples in the report where you've got a, a combat medic overseeing the security operations at a forward operating base. Um, we've got other instances where one uh, contract Re a contract officer representative is overseeing 15 different contracts in addition to performing their principal duty, which is unrelated to any of the, the contracts that person is overseeing. So there's a shortage, uh, there's a training problem, and there is a casting problem of applying the right kind of skills to that, the contract oversight. And in many cases, we don't have those skills within the Army. Uh, so. And if I could just add one other quick point. Uh, a number of, the, of these, uh, say, the contracting uh, uh, officer representatives, these corps, uh, they may come in and leave, and the contractor's still there. Uh, so, you know, they, they don't have the institutional knowledge, and they don't stay long enough. Uh, so that's another part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, first of all say that I think the work you're doing is very, very important. And I hope that um, it doesn't just gather dust. And I'm, I'm very pleased that our former colleague, uh, Congressman Shays, is on the panel <coughs> because I always thought that uh, Chairman Shays was one of the uh, finest members that this committee ever had. Um, uh, uh, Jim, can you pull that microphone a little closer to me? Thank you. Um, 
I, uh, I have been tremendously concerned uh, about the horrendous waste that's been going on in the Defense Department, uh, and especially so after a year, a year and a half ago when the GAO came out with a report that uh, said that we had uh, $295 billion in cost overruns in just our 72 largest weapons systems. And it seems to me that anybody who considers uh, himself or herself to be fiscally conservative should have been extremely upset or horrified by that, yet uh, it didn't seem that uh, many people were. And, and it, it looks as though both parties are trying to prove how patriotic they are or are, are concerned that somebody might feel that they're not patriotic if they don't just give the Defense Department every penny that they want and then some. And now uh, we're, we're ramping up in Afghanistan and spending uh, um, unbelievable amounts of money there. And then I re read in uh, your testimony, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Thibault, that um, you're talking about massive confusion and loss, enormous waste. You say billions in, of dollars in wasteful spending has occurred and may still be occurring. And uh, it, it, it looks to me like, the, uh, you know, uh, it would be, it really would be unpatriotic if we didn't uh, question these things and, and do everything possible to stop all this uh, waste, yet uh, very few people are, are willing to vote uh, against anything the Defense Department wants, so uh, apparently nothing is being done, and there's, I, I, I sometimes wonder if there are any fiscal conservatives at the uh, Pentagon. The cor according to the Congressional Research Service, we're now spending, when we add in the regular budget, the supplemental bills, and we're getting ready to vote on another supplemental bill here uh, within either this week or a few days from now, and yet in the emergency appropriations and then all the money that they throw into the omnibus, uh, according to the CRS, we're spending more on defense than all the other nations in the world combined. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, a lot of it is generated because the defense contractors hire all the retired admirals and generals, and then they, they call it the revolving door at the Pentagon. But somebody is going to have to, we, I don't think that we can just keep on wasting and blowing money in the way that we're doing. But the, the only question I have, you, you, you say, uh, Mr. Thibault, at one point in your testimony, you say that there are a number of, uh, of new projects in, in the pipeline. And you mentioned this $30 million um, dining facility. H how many rough guess uh, how many other new projects are going on or that, are we talking about? I can't answer that question because that's our immediate action on our next, we're doing the analysis. We know it's two billion dollars. What we want to do is go out and touch those projects to look at them to see if they make sense. That's where you need people in theater. It just happened that this was shared with us when we happened to visit that base. And, uh, you know, there are a couple hundred bases in Iraq. We visited three or four of them. And there's obviously a need to, one, do the analysis, and then, two, go out and look at the high-dollar items and ask those questions. Does this make sense with the drawdown of Iraq? So, so do you mean uh, by saying that that you've only visited three or four and there are hundreds of bases? So, so is the two billion just a tip of the iceberg estimate, or is that? Uh, no, that that's what's in the pipeline as approved uh, construction projects, and it, it's kind of interesting. This project, this example uh, of the the dining facility, right next to it, and, and they needed to feed 4,000 individuals. They upgraded it because they had a lot of problems with it, the the existing one. And they spent 3.6 million dollars. Well, that had just occurred. And what happened is the paperwork that showed all the problems that led to this upgrading the cafeteria and being sure it could serve the proper number never made it over into the planning documents for the new construction. So they still thought they had this dilapidated dining facility. And, and I don't, you know, the only thing I can think of, and it's the importance of, of the chairman, uh, you have to go out and look at it. You have to spend the time in the country because if we hadn't, None of that would have come forward. You can't just do an analysis of paperwork because it would have said dilapidated facility, need to build it. The paperwork would say makes sense. Well, it had just been renovated, so we're going to have two great dining facilities. Well, right. and then My it was also up. done Thank at a time uh, before the agreement between Iraq and the U.S. when we would depart. So 
as it, <coughs> excuse me, as it turns out, we'll have this new wonderful dining facility for about two years. Is it the same contractor doing both the repair work and the new, uh, new facility? Yes, sir, in this case. And so they never spoke up, of course, and said, what are we doing here? Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shays, I want to welcome you back thank you. before the committee. Great to see you. And I uh, thank you all for your, your great work. Uh, I haven't been over to Iraq as many times as Mr. Shays has, but uh, I'm up around a dozen now. Uh, one of my jobs before I came to Congress, uh, I spent a lot of time on construction sites. I have a uh, construction engineering degree. And uh, I, am, uh, I am surprised that we get as much work done in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, given the, the, the contract arrangements that we have. Uh, I've seen just horror shows. Uh, I've visited a lot of uh, construction sites in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I, I frankly think that Stuart Bowen, the, special ins the former Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, did a fantastic job. But uh, <clears throat> from my visits to Afghanistan, I, I think that the the situation there and the inspector general in Afghanistan is far less able. Uh, he's newer, uh, his team is newer, but far less able to uh, police the contracting situation there. So I am, uh, I am very apprehensive about our ability to, to, to lose money in Afghanistan and to waste it uh, just through incompetence as well as through, as through fraud. Uh, one of the earliest hearings we had in here uh, back in 2003-2004 on Iraq, I asked the director for the uh, DCAA, the Defense Contracting Audit Agency, I said, how many contractors, how many, excuse me, how many auditors do you have in, in Iraq? And he said, uh, we don't have any. And at this point, we had, we were spending billions of dollars there, billions. And uh, I said, well, how, how does that work then? And he said, well, we are auditing our, our work and our contracts in Iraq from Alexandria, Virginia, which explain why, you know, it, it's reflected in your own report, but explains why we're having such a problem here. And uh, now I read, again, from the committee's memo that we've got, we've got four folks four individuals in Afghanistan, in the whole country. Uh, we're spending billions of dollars there. We've got two at Bagram Air Force Base and we've got two down in Kandahar. And that is it. And if we don't, if we don't get a handle on that, with boots on the ground, people competent enough to review these contracts, uh, this, this, is, this is criminal. It's criminal. Uh, you know, there's, there's nobody who would operate like this on a, in a private basis, if we were spending, you know, private uh, corporate dollars, this wouldn't be happening. I think it's happening only because we're spending taxpayer dollars and people feel that uh, it, it doesn't have to be audited to that great degree. We're, we're terribly sloppy uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got to tighten up our, you know, our act. Uh, what do you see is, is the greatest need in terms of getting some accountability on the ground. We, we, we can't continue to operate this way uh, in terms of uh, the contracts going out without tight enough uh, um, accountability standards or, or recognizable standards. You know, I, I go on, on to jobs in, in Iraq uh, where, you know, just from walking on the job site, you can see uh, substandard materials. I try to talk to the, the workers there. I had an, an Iraqi interpreter with me. Turns out they're all from, from India. Now, you've got 60% unemployment in Iraq. You know, why, why the heck are we bringing in foreign workers? God bless the folks from India, but you ought to put some people from Iraq to work. And uh, it, it just seems there's no requirements in the contracts that would, would uh, help the overall cause of, of putting people to work and stabilizing that country. But uh, from, your own, from your own attendance there and your own observations on the ground, what do you think needs to be done first and, uh, and, and fastest? I think the first thing uh, we need to do is to encourage the Department of Defense to make this one of their highest priorities. We have spent in contracting $103 billion. 
in Afghanistan, 20 billion, in Kuwait, 18 billion, and in the other countries supporting Iraq and Afghanistan, 12.7 billion, 154 billion dollars. And what we know is we don't have enough contract office representatives, we don't have enough quality assurance representatives, we don't have enough log cap support officers, uh, we don't have enough people watching the contractors. Uh, we have 70% of our contracts go to subcontractors. Our law in this country makes it a requirement that we can over, only oversee the con subcontractor by going through the prime. Uh, and so we have to get the information secondhand. I think we need to re-examine that. If 70% of the dollars I mentioned are actually going to the subs, uh, we have another issue, and that is if it's uh, Afghan employees or Iraqi employees, they, we have to deal with those governments, and there are certain protections and uh, hoops that we have to jump. And it would strike me that if we are going to spend our dollars there, that we should have greater ability to oversee the contracts that are done by the indigenous folks paid for by us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, I do note in your report at one point you saw an example of cutting right through the prime and going straight to the subcontractor, making that person the prime. I mean, that's just having a better capacity on our own stand and not have to rely on a contractor so they don't take a cut. Uh, and I think your report indicated in one of those instances the, the subcontractor had jacked, their, uh, had jacked the prices up and then the prime went out, just doubled it, and then passed it along, and so they took all that off the top. So I, I think you're exactly right and I hope that you do continue to look at that aspect and share it with us. On page nine of your report, you have a little sidebar that you talk about cracks in Kabul. Uh, you have a new Kabul compound where supposedly the United States forces in Afghanistan headquarters are going to be, where Mr. Chris, uh, General McChrystal will be sitting, except that he won't because there are structural cracks, improper plumbing, and thus unusable bathrooms, incorrectly sized sewage systems, broken and, le and le leaking pipes, sinking sidewalks, and other construction defects. How is, does that happen? that somebody signs off on a project like that and we end up getting tagged for the bill and having an unusable uh, building on that. One, one of the uh, recurring themes is accountability. How does that happen? In this particular instance, uh, the United States Corps of Engineers signed I'm off. Sorry, I can't in, hear the, you. in this particular instance, the United States Corps of Engineers signed off that this $18 million contract by a Turkish construction company was adequate. And it's interesting because it talks to a little bit of our methodology. When we were over there, we, in, we interviewed the senior. He happened to be a major uh, individual that inherited this building. Well, actually, you talk about rework. Great example of rework because as these repairs are ongoing, the logistics contractor, it's, it's essential to do it so they can habitate this, uh, KBR is doing much of the work that this Turkish company, and they came in and voided the warranty because they came in and approved everything. Now, the only way you could physically approve it is to not be physically there. <coughs> because in just this list where we asked for an information paper from the responsible person now, major issues, septic, electrical, ceiling tiles falling down, 250 missing, fire alarm system. I mean, these are big deals. Power generator, so kit who, kitchen exhaust. Who, it was KBI responsible for Managing the work of that Turkish outfit? No, no, that was a separate uh, so contractor. So the Turkish outfit it was, was, the, was the contractor, It the was prime. the contractor. Yes, sir, KBR came to the rescue, okay. but that's all rework. All right, so now do we know whether or not the Army Corps of Engineer official who was responsible for that was ever disciplined? No, we don't, and, and that's, that's the accountability issue. Somewhere, and, and that's uh, Commissioner Shea's point, I think, you know, we have to start identifying who's responsible Absolutely. And, and not just that individual, Thank but you. someone's reviewing and training his workload. And, and so I think it goes up a little higher. Uh, you know, my, my, my suggestion in this process is we have seen military accountability in situations, but we just have not yet seen where these situations occur. Someone said why and if they're inept. Yeah. I mean, I would think that that company no longer does business with us, but I fear that they probably do. Oh, they that they type do, of sir. Thing. They do, sir. On that. Um, and so that's one of the things you'll be investigating as well, is what kind of a process we put in place to make sure that when that happens, it, they don't do any more business with us and that people be held accountable for it. 
Are you getting enough access to the information of the people that you need as a commission, or do you feel that uh, you need the assistance of any committee in Congress? Are people being responsive? Uh, are they being helpful, or are they being obstructionist? Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, we have had the need to explain in detail sometimes why we need information, but by and large, Department of Defense and Department of State have supported us. Where we really are, are straining is your point about getting in the country. Our first two trips were delayed about a month because of conflicts and schedule. They did it. The trips went off very well, and they supported it, U.S. CENTCOM. But we have a need for four other trips, and they're saying, whoa. Uh, and so we're going to have to find that out. Just how, will, will they allow us to go in and do this job? Because if we can't go out there and look at the records there, we, we will fail. Well, it speaks again to your presence in country if, if necessary. But you will work with our committees and this committee in the Senate, and we will try to help you with that. A as soon as we have a, a, a delay, Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, and, and Mr. Fine. Chairman, I'd like to say it's very helpful for your encouragement that we be in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. Uh, I remember that the Inspector General of DOD said he didn't need to be there. Um, and our, our com your committee uh, made him go. Right. And, uh, and we benefited from it. So uh, well, We benefit when we go. It's not like we're going there for vacation. It certainly isn't someplace we want to be. But you do, as I think uh, Chairman Tebow mentioned a couple times, you get to see things that on paper uh, might present themselves entirely differently and, and work on that. So we're conscious of that and we want to work with you in, to make that happen. Will you talk a little bit about the challenges where the, the contractors or the subcontractors are third country nationals or host country nationals and the, the problems those present uh, and what we're going to look into in terms of trying to resolve those issues, those challenges? Charles? Um. When, when um, we have followed, there have been audits which we've followed up. Um, as noted, uh, the prime contractor may be KBR, but the work uh, or, the, or the, the dining facilities that are being run or the, um, um, the other work that's being done is done by a third, uh, a third country company uh, like First Kuwaiti Trading Company or Tamimi. Um, and the, the audits there show that um, those subcontractors may well get away with overcharging because it's not that much in KBR's interest and it doesn't even have the business systems to create competition under it. The overcharges from the subcontractor then get passed up with a factor for award fees and a factor for overhead until it, it comes to the, the Treasury. Um, we, we are facing the legal the Commission is trying to figure out the legal challenge and it is a new one. You don't find this as a problem in the domestic United States. This is a, uh, but it's a big one in theater where we are, and we're trying to look at what could be done to increase the ability to, uh, say, audit uh, such third country companies. Great. Could I just emphasize, so we have the government that's supposed to oversee the contractors, and we have less than half of what we need. Uh, they aren't specialists. Uh, they have to be taught, and then they're asked to leave sooner than the contractor who's still there. And then we have uh, DCAA point out that most of the uh, technology that the contractors use is outdated, inaccurate, and not helpful and doesn't provide the right information. So then when we want to get the information, we're getting it from, a, from the company itself that can't provide really well-documented information. Do our contracts not require these contractors to have updated technology with certain specifications that would service our needs? They're required to have it, but they, have, they don't, don't have, have it. it. Okay, that's what I'll make sure. So that is something we'll be chasing down. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tebow, can you cite specific examples of services? Ma'am? Yes. Mr. Flake, you must lift your mic. You're so tall. All right. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, can you cite some specific examples of services that can be provided uh, under a different contractor under uh, log cap four and, and why you believe that switching contractors might be able to yield uh, better results or better well, cost? Yes. The way the contract is structured now, sir, is there are three, every task order now is theoretically supposed to be bid out and evaluated for those three contractors, DynCor International, Floor and KBR. Um, the early results are that's a very good thing for the government 
in terms of price and cost, that competition. Those are the three organizations now. That's a long-running contract also. The, the problem is, is, is 90 plus percent of the current charges are with the old contract, which is the sole supplier. And one of our emphasis, and I'll, and I'll uh, point out that uh, I think it was General Odiorno identified the same issue, which is get on with the competition part of Log Cap 4. Right. Uh, you know, we're, we're just, you know, lots of planning, lots of effort, and it's not happening to the extent that, that it should. Thank you. Um, the pace of withdrawal in Iraq, you mentioned in the report some of the challenges uh, that that, uh, that presents us with. What are some of those challenges, the, the rapid pace of withdrawal that we have? Um, somebody else want to take that? Sure. Um, I, I think that uh, there are a number of factors, um, and uh, CENTCOM is, is planning for this, uh, whether they've done enough planning, whether that plan is moving at a pace that is going to accommodate the downsizing and the ramp up, uh, we don't know yet. But specifically, but, what, what opportunities are there for, for abuse or fraud or, or waste uh, with rapid withdrawal? What do we have well, to Well, I after? think as, as troops are withdrawn from, Afghan or from Iraq, as an example, uh, we're probably going to have to rely on contractors to remain there to close down those bases or to pass them on to the Iraqis. Um, and there, there, one difficulty that was brought to our attention, for example, just shows a lack of planning and, and for, uh, forethought, uh, forethought on this, is uh, they pulled out the air conditioning units in buildings that were going to be passed to the Iraqis and then had to go back and reinstall them again because they just didn't think enough about when they took the, the equipment out that it would still be needed because the Iraqis were going to take over that. But the, the, all the decisions on reset, which equipment gets sent back here for uh, rehab, uh, which is going to go to the reserve components, which will be scrapped, which will be turned over to the Iraqis, uh, all of those planning decisions are, are currently being made by CENTCOM. But again, um, I'm not yet comfortable uh, that there aren't a lot of holes in that planning process. And, and, I, and I might add as, as an example, when we were on one of the bases, the military enlisted person that's going to be involved in, in some of that support activity kind of pointed over and said, look at all those containers. You know what? I haven't opened them. I don't know what's in there. And that's this point that we accumulated material, and now we're going to have to inventory it while the military, you know, it's dwell time. If they're given 90 days to get out of there, they're going to leave in 90 days. But the, the outcome is contractors are going to have to go out there and figure out because there could be some very sensitive equipment, so you can't just give it to them. And so the, 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 the important point is as we see a decline in the military, there's not going to be a proportional decline in the contractors. In fact, it, it, it might go the other way depending on the activity. 600,000 line items have to be tracked. We all know that we need contractors. We had one contractor for every six military in the Revolutionary War. Now it's a one for one. The irony is as we get out of Iraq, we may actually have more contractors than we have military. And we have the disposal of what we call white property. That's property in the hands of the contractors, but owned by the U.S. government. And then we have uh, items on base that no one knows who's responsible for. But I'd just love to just reiterate, the, re review the list that, that uh, Mr. Grant, Commissioner Grant talked about. We can donate it to the Iraqi government. We can return it to the United States, use it elsewhere in Iraq or move it to Afghanistan, transfer it to other U.S. government agencies, sell it, uh, and if it has no commercial value, scrap it. We are asking people to make those decisions, and they may not know what is needed in another base. So they may decide that we should give it away when we're going to still purchase it somewhere else or bring it from the United States to Afghanistan when it was in Iraq, and we could have gotten it from there. So it just speaks to the need for more coordination and yeah. cooperation. And is it worth it to ship it home? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's simple to say, well, give it, give it to the Iraqis. Well, maybe that is the right decision. One, to follow up on Commissioner Shea's first point, I think we need to think hard, as does this subcommittee, 
there's an inherent implied concern that we have too many contractors. Whether we do or not, uh, I, I'm not prepared to answer that. And the Joint Staff has, in fact, got a task force looking at what things are appropriate to be contracted out. And it, it goes to inherently governmental and, and those things. But how did we get to this point? And then, you know, what decisions were made by the services, what decisions were made by OSD, by uh, OMB, and by the Congress that, that get us to this one-to-one -one ratio or whatever it may be. But I think more important is what are the options? Uh, do we increase force structure uh, within DOD and state so that we have not just the contracting oversight expertise, but we got folks to do some of these jobs that are now being done by contractors. Do we change the emphasis within the services to push more things into the, op uh, into the sustainment force, out of the operational force? Uh, do we provide just less services or less quality services? Or do we just accept the fact that this is the way we're going to go to war? And I think those questions we need to, to, to focus on, in addition to waste, fraud, and abuse. That was a, a large part of the, uh, the formation of this. And you know from reading your own uh, charge in, in the legislation that that's a piece of the work that we really very seriously want to have done. Mr. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Chairman, just, just one last uh, comment. Uh, I think we have far too many contractors. When I read that we have 240,000 contractors in the two uh, uh, arenas and uh, or the uh, Afghanistan and Iraq put together and that 80% of them are foreign nationals, it seems to me that this is just a, a gravy train of money uh, for these uh, defense contractors, number one, and for all these uh, uh, contractors, uh, and I think almost anybody in this country, almost any average American would say that it's ridiculous that we're still spending all this money hiring all these foreign nationals and doing all the, and, and committing all the waste, fraud, and abuse or allowing it to go on over there. And uh, I think it's really, it's really sad and it's, and it's uh, really shameful, really. Thank you. You know, I, I think the other uh, question that we asked, uh, or part of that question that we asked was, what is inherently a governmental responsibility and what is not? That's the nub. All right, what, what are we doing with some of these people? Uh, are they really doing a job that should only be entrusted to somebody that is, uh, you know, a U.S. citizen or a member of the armed services or, in some respect, responsible up the, uh, the chain here? Uh, security strikes me as, as one of those things, very much, you know, who's protecting whom within these countries, and uh, that's been something we've had hearings on in the past, but we're looking forward to your in-depth work on that issue to help us inform, you know, what's of the many definitions of inherent, inherently governmental responsibility, what's the one that we're going to settle on, uh, and then how we're going to make that determination. Uh, Colonel Green, I agree, you know, nobody has really discussed what's the proper number of contractors out there. And, and Chris, you, you mentioned, you know, the different ratios over time, one to one, it went up and then it went down again, and, and, and now it is where it is. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, at some point, the argument that we've heard, you know, uh, when it wasn't really anything that we could do about it uh, at this time when different people were running the military in the, in the White House before our day, was that it was just cheaper to contract it out. I don't think there's any evidence of, of that at all. And, and it certainly would be helpful to have somebody explore that aspect of it, how it could possibly be cheaper when we look at these numbers and these, uh, this degree of difficulty that's been going on. The other part of that, so we have to get the numbers right, we have to get the assignment of who should be doing what correct. We need to have the right management and oversight in place. That gets back to the capacity issue that you're talking about and report in there, and that'll be critical uh, if you can help us with that. But in that vein, we have people stationed in over 1,000 bases all over the world. That's not counting Afghanistan, Iraq, and Kuwait, and all the places servicing those two theaters right now. Over 1,000 bases elsewhere that for some reason we seem just incapable of reviewing and deciding whether the hell they deserve to be there, they should be there, what's their function, are they really adding on something of value to our national security interest, and what are all the people that are there doing? Can't you take some of them and train them? Some of them may have technical expertise. Some of them may have the ability to be trained to do certain aspects of it, or whether instead of sitting 
uh, at some base uh, for a reason that was valid maybe 25, 30 years ago, but may not be valid today. We'll be looking into that issue separately, but uh, I think it's something to note here. Uh, prioritize the dues. The other is National Guard and the reservists do have expertise, particularly in security and other areas where maybe a better identification of who's in these forces and their deployment will put them in the proper position. It'll be easier to train, you know, police officers and things of that nature for security uh, on that basis. So if somebody in the management structure of the Department of Defense and State has to be looking at these issues in a much more sophisticated and, and better way on that. Even the civilian corps that we're now developing hopefully will be a help, although that's not going to happen as quickly as we want. Let me uh, just wrap up my question on this with the Defense Acquisition University aspect of it. Um, did anybody think of putting it on a disk so that you didn't necessarily have to connect uh, when you were doing that? It was just, just beyond the Defense University's capacity to, to conjure. Well, I, I would propose they probably have it on a disk, but they told the individual to take it online. You know, so kind of kind of silly if the, if you don't have a set of disks, you can't yeah. give them a disk. I mean, that would seem a, a way to get it done, and, and that university to ramp up and, and get people through on that basis. I'm concerned that our contractors are not using the kind of technology that they need to use. It seems to me that's a contract enforcement issue, and uh, for all that we're going to hear for apologists for the contractors coming in here telling us, oh, they're the good guys, all of the stuff, all about your bad management, uh, they're partially right. Uh, these uh, organizations owe it to their own people, the people that are over there giving their lives and being injured, as uh, Chairman Tabo said, and to the taxpayers of this country to do what the contract says, to put the kind of technology in there that has to be put in so that we can track these things and follow through. They owe it to us to speak up when they're building a $30 million uh, place for people to eat or whatever, and they're also repairing another place and know or, or should know probably better than anybody Absolutely. that that's it. Uh, that's not funny. It may be profitable, but it's not good. They owe it to the taxpayer of this country to not let, uh, to not just double a number coming from somebody else and pass it along without making note of it. Uh, so there's, uh, there's enough criticism to go around here on that, and they certainly have a portion of it, and that's why we need management oversight. If we could trust them to do everything on the up and up, uh, we wouldn't be so concerned about it. But when I look at the examples that you stated and the others in previous reports, uh, we have a capacity issue. We've got to get the management oversight in there, and we have to move forward on that basis. We have lots uh, that we want to talk to you about over the coming uh, period of time, and uh, we credit you for the work that you've done. The Aegis situation is one, I think, a serious import in your report that we'll look forward to you expanding that out, as you say you will in your report. Uh, but what the work that you are doing is, I think, going to be very helpful to us. It's going to help us focus on what we need to do in terms of legislation or probably more in line oversight to hold the feet to the fire of the people that are not doing the management work that they should do and not organizing and planning as they should or what we need to do to help them do that if they're not getting that capacity. Mr. Flake, do you have anything you'd like to add before we no. let this panel go? No. Okay. Thank you for your we testimony. We just thank you for your testimony and for your service and the offer remains to, to work with you if we can be helpful in having your responsibilities fulfilled. Thank, thank you, you very Mr. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll take about a five-minute break before the second panel starts. Thank you.